My guest today is Hillel Wayne. How are you, Hillel? I'm doing all right. How are you doing? I'm doing better than all right. Oh well. <laughs> well, I'm well, not nice. in the middle of I'm not in the middle of a move as I heard you are. Yeah. So there's less stress in my life. Uh, what do yeah. you do? Um, so I'm what's called a formal methods consultant. I teach companies how to use this technique called formal methods. Um, the particular one that we're talking about today is called TLA plus. Yeah which is what I'll be describing for the rest of this um, podcast. All right. You said a formal method. Is that right? Yeah. Formal methods. Yeah. Well, let's start with that. What's defined when you say formal method? What do you mean? So formal methods is this large discipline and branch of building what we call mathematically correct software. And by that, I mean that people are normally used to testing um, things using like, a t like, like test suites, right? Or sometimes people go so far as to use like, say, a type system to make sure that their, their code doesn't have bugs. Formal methods is one step above that. So there's a couple of different branches of it. The most famous branch being, can we use a mathematical like descriptions of a, of a program to prove that all of its properties that we want hold by the code? And then if it doesn't hold, the program won't even compile. I run a program that showcases some of that branch of formal methods um, called Let's Prove Left Pad. I'm sure there can be links in the show notes. Yes. Okay, I can give Send you a link. Let's prove left, left pad. Let Let's prove left pad afterwards, showing how you can actually take like a snippet of code and then prove using a um, theorem prover or some other system that if it compiles, it is one hundred percent correct. That's mm -hmm. the most famous branch of um, formal methods. I work in a slightly different branch called formal specification, which is about doing that same thing except to designs. You have a abstract design of your system and a blueprint almost, and then you try to make sure that that blueprint has properties you want. This branch is a little bit less powerful. You can't show the code itself works like correctly, but it's a lot faster and cheaper for companies to use. So it's becoming more popular um, over the past few years than, this, than the primary branch, I'd say. Okay. Uh, so, and you're in this subfield, so formal specifications. Yeah. You're using a specific tool to accomplish this, right? Yeah. TLA plus it's called. Okay. And I had never, until I met you, I had never heard of TLA plus. Can we define that? Yeah, it's that? pretty obscure. Uh, what what is TLA? What what problem does TLA plus solve? So, I'd say the main class of problems used for, used for is designing concurrent or distributed systems. The canonical example is you have a bank. I know this is not how banks work, but it's just a good demonstration of like how this tool could be used. And you have transactions; people are wiring each other money, and you want to show that your design for how a transaction is processed doesn't lead to anybody accidentally overdrafting their account. So you can show, for example, that a simple description of what a wire looks like, say you check how much money there's in the account, and then you withdraw some money, then you deposit some money. And you can show that based on how that's described, a certain sequence of transactions for certain amounts of money that interleave in certain ways have a race condition that leads to an account being overdrafted. Okay. Um, so this is uh, TLA plus allows you to create tests of something like that. Yeah, sort of, but at like a higher level, you're testing the design itself. So you're testing it before you start writing code. You're saying, yeah, yeah. Tell me, what does that look like? Uh, I'm, 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 a, I'm an architect. I'm designing a system yeah. and, uh, what, what in, do I have to have my design in a specific format in order for, for TLA yes. plus to work? Yeah. So on TLA it? plus is actually a language. So it's, it's like a programming language, except it, you, um, except it describes abstract sort of systems. So okay. I'd write my system in this TLA plus language. Instead of being run, the code is model checked. And what that means is that we take the initial setup of the code, like the initial setup of like any code, and then run through every possibility, every random um, outcome, every concurrent interleaving and check every single state that can come from that, and then see if any of those break some sort of test that we have. And a test would be something like just verify that the same amount that came out of one uh, account is the same amount that went into another account. That might be an example of a test that you could run. Yeah, or at no point should any account in anywhere in the system ever go below zero dollars. I see. Okay. Yeah, those are what's called safety properties, that bad things don't happen. TLA Plus can also use this to check what's called liveness properties, or that good things are bound to happen. An example of a of a um, liveness property would be, given this amount of money in the system, after we've processed every single transaction, we have the same amount of money in the system. Right. So that can be wrong temporarily as we're moving money between accounts, but it has to be right at the end. 
You can't right. have a process crash and the money just disappear. Uh, it has to be able to survive something like that. The, yes. Either roll back the transaction or uh, commit yeah. the transaction. In the mm -hmm. And if that doesn't happen, or if that doesn't happen, then TLA, then the model checker can say, hey, in this very specific sequence of events, you do not roll back this transaction or it crashes halfway through and then you've lost money in the system. Okay. And you write those specifications in this uh, domain specific language, TLA yeah. plus language. Yes. Now, what does that language look like? Is it similar to a programming language that I might know or a, a um, human readable language that I might know? Probably not, sadly. So it, it was basically designed by a couple of, by a logician um, who designed it after mathematical syntax. So it looks a little bit okay. alien to a lot of people when it starts out, although you quickly get used to it. That said, there in about about ten years ago, um, people wrote this um, tool called PlusCal, which is essentially a language that compiles to TLA plus that looks a lot more like a programming language. So Amazon Web Services used PlusCal in twenty fourteen, I believe, and showed that this was um, able to find really complicated bugs in S three and DynamoDB. So mm -hmm. you can there are versions of it that do look a lot more like programming languages, and I believe that. Um, just last year, this one company, I'm not look, investigated this too much, but this one company came out with a tool called Quint that looks even more like a programming language and also compiles to TLA+. Okay. Um, and then um, once I've got my specifications written in TLA+, is there, um, I still have to write the code itself. Is there any yeah. way of translating or generating code from this? What's uh, Yeah, that's sort of I, the holy grail of formal know. methods to basically be able to write a formal specification and then generate code from that. The problem is that this is, incredibly ludicrously difficult um, because right. the code has just so many more details and so much more that has to go on at a level that like the spec doesn't need to care about. So mm -hmm. the way I normally pitch it to companies is that, yes, you do have to write the code afterwards, but the overall effect is that you're writing code that you know will do something that you know is going to be correct versus writing code that you hope is going to be correct, but could just have a fundamental design flaw. And for that reason, it ends up being a lot cheaper and faster to write um, complicated systems by first modeling them in TLA plus than by just jumping straight to the code. Um, there are some investigations by research co companies to do something that seems to be more effective, which is taking a TLA plus specification and generating a test suite from that. MongoDB um, has demonstrated some really good success with that. I can also link a paper to that too. Um, so that's a nascent field that's really undergoing a lot of exciting developments, but it's still not like mainstream yet. Okay, so if TLA plus is defining things like safety checks and yeah. limits, then tests would be would look at that code and this and, and or, or or some tool would look at that code and generate a test to see yeah. you know does this ever fall below zero? Yeah. Um, does the actual code because you really you have to repeat that work again you've, uh, once you've once you've created the design the design yeah. can be perfect but if I don't code exactly to the design which is mm -hmm. Kind of a human step and <laughs> it could easily happen. Yeah, that's absolutely but true. Then again, if, then again, if you don't have the design, then when your code fails, is it because the you just implemented a good design correctly right. or because you correctly implemented a bad design? I should emphasize right. here that um, TLA plus, like the writing of the spec usually takes like a 10th to like a 20th as long as writing the code itself. On Makes one sense. project I've worked on, the spec took two days and the code took two months. So you're really not like losing that much time by writing the spec first. Are there any times when you wouldn't want to use TLA plus? Yeah, so that's actually an interesting question because there's two ways we can take that. We can take that into what are the cases where you'd want to write a specification, but not write in TLA plus. And then there's the case of things where you would not want to write a specification at all. And I'll focus on the second question for now. Yeah. I'd say that the spaces where you wouldn't really want to write a specification are one code where you expect to have it finished within like, a day or two. TLA plus I found is mostly economical if you're expecting to take like a couple of weeks to a month on a code base or a project. Um, two, you can have like really complicated legacy code where to make the changes you want to make, you'd have to write a very like large model before you can actually start working that, in which case it might not be like advisable to just try to do all that work up front just to make a small, just to uh, make a change to something that already exists. Mm -hmm. um, Three, there's certain aspects of, there's certain classes of code that just I found aren't really that good for modeling, like say like simulation or highly computational code, just because you can't really, like the, the code itself is the, you don't know really what properties you want out of the code and you don't really know what the code is supposed to be, you don't know what the answer is supposed to be until you run it, right? So like if you're, if you're like, if you're simulating, but I know I'm, I'm stumbling a bit here because this is a complicated question. Um, 
let's I think just I understand what you're saying. Like if you're, let's take a simple example. If you're cool, yeah. if you write a, a class that's just doing arithmetic, it's hard to design for that because you know it's just an addition, for example, yeah. and adds two numbers together. Well, the code itself is the test. There's not much design beyond that. You'd have to write that, even though that's very simple code. But if you're writing something that's doing some, I don't know, machine learning yeah. analysis, some really complex code. Same thing. It's the code itself. Is yeah, exactly. Machine learning is a great to... example. So I've seen people formally specify the pipelines, the ETL pipelines that get data into the machine learning system. Okay. But I've not seen anybody try to specify the machine learning itself just because you really don't know where that's supposed to be going. It's all about the discovery. Okay. You spent years uh, working with this tool. So it's in, familiar to you, but I think for, it's fair to say most of the audience is not familiar with TLA+. Yeah. Plus. Yeah. Is, um, where would they go? Where would they right. start? So that's a good, that's, that's a good question. Um, so I actually am very, very um, fond of these class of tools and think that they are very underused, that there is a lot more people out there who would benefit from them than who know about them. So we'll change I've, some minds today. Yep. So I'm, I've done a lot of work to make these tools more accessible. In the case of TLA plus the, um, I run the site called learntla.com. Huh. Again, we'll be in the show notes and it's designed to take a person who doesn't know anything about the space, who's never even heard of it, to being able to write useful business-ready specifications. So that's where I'd recommend people start. Uh, is there a compiler for TLA Plus or a transpiler? Or what's uh, when, when I run it, what do I need in order to run it? So yeah, the tool is self-contained. So you're writing the TLA, you, um, you get the TLA, um, either the TLA toolbox, which is in the main IDE, or there's also a Visual Studio Code extension. And what okay. those do is they come with the model checker. So then you're just writing the TLA Plus specification and the model checker takes it from there. You don't need to compile it to anything else. There are, and as mentioned earlier, there are languages that compile to TLA plus. So if you're using those languages, you need to bring the, a model checker with you. Uh, so these TLA uh, uh, code modules, are, are they then part of my project? If I'm building, for example, a .NET project, do they live with the source code? Yeah, you probably t attach them to the source code. Check them into version control and everything, and you know, put them in the code review. Have people code review the specs. You find interesting stuff out that way. Very useful. Oh, I thought of an interesting thing that I don't think has been mentioned so far. So, what does TLA Plus stand for? I've got a question. Yeah. <laughs> what, what does a three-letter acronym stand for? <laughs> okay, yeah. So, um, it's one of the running gags of the of, of sort of the community that we just never really tell people what it stands for, but it stands for what's called temporal logic of actions, after of the um, mathematical framework that um, that powers it. I've written an article explaining like what that means and why it means that that goes through the entire history of the logic behind it. Um, again, I will include that link afterwards. Oh, excellent. So you can look, look down. You can see the link in the, um, in the, in the, in the expansion. In learn TLA plus. Or... Um, no, it's, it's a separate link. I just wrote this actually like two weeks ago. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Is it, um, uh, is there, is there, yeah. is there a cost to use no, TLA source. plus? That's all open source, so I can we can even view the source code and we can contribute to it. Yeah. How, how active is this project? It's been around a while. Though. This is yeah. So it's fairly there. it's it's fairly active. Um, micro it's um running under Microsoft Research. They pay a couple people to work on it full time, and then other mm -hmm. people in the community have been building like tools around it or tools that work with it. There's this one group working on a different model checker using different like ideas called um Appalachi. This is run by a group called Informal Systems that also does a lot of. Um, contributions to it. And there's a TLA plus foundation that sort of oversees the work and manages funding and development, okay. but it's all free. So it, it happens to be Microsoft folks that started it or are maintaining it, but it's fully open I think source. it's actually, no, I think what happened was, um, I think what happened was that it started work at AT&T and then the inventor was hired by Microsoft research um, about 15 years ago or so. So okay. it doesn't, it doesn't come from Microsoft. They just happen to be funding most of the work right now. Got it. Okay. Yeah. We, we do a lot of things like that. that yeah. Uh, we're, we're, we're kind of involved, but we're kind of not yeah. taking ownership of it, letting mm -hmm. it live out in the open source world, mm -hmm. which I like. Yeah. Um, excellent. Well, hello. This has really been educational for me because this is a topic mm -hmm. that I didn't know about at all until I met you. So thank you. Yeah. Welcome. I really love talking about this stuff, as you can tell by me coming on a podcast. <laughs>
so I think like it's really important for us to sort of have that both that humility and that awareness that like the world is really big and we are only seeing a small slice of it and there's a lot that we can do to basically just make people's lives a lot better even if it's not like all the big exciting things that dominate the news I spent I spent a I spent a um I spent a few months once just like going through doing IT for this one nonprofit and just like removing bugs from all of their like sorry like removing bullet from all their computers and they said it was a huge benefit and I just think about that a lot of like how much more we could be contributing helping people but we just don't realize it because we're just so we don't realize that people need this kind of stuff